am Courtney. I have a husband named John, who is two years younger than me. His carelessness often troubles me. Our relationship began when I was 27 years old and met John at a matchmaking party. At that time, we were both seeking a life partner. My previous boyfriends had been indifferent to marriage or were financially struggling, but John was different. While we were dating, he would carry my bags and often treat me to meals, always being kind. However, I later realized that he had been doing the same things for his sister, Wendy, so his actions with women had become habitual. After we got married, John's attitude remained the same, but his priorities changed. It became more apparent than when we were dating. I had thought he was especially kind only to me. John's family includes his mother and his sister. His father is still alive, but several years ago, after a fierce dispute between his parents, they got divorced, leaving his mother living alone at home. Consequently, his mother frequently visits our apartment. I'm struggling financially. Your father has abandoned me, and I don't know what to do. Please, John, come back home. How can I manage alone, dear? She pleaded with tears in her eyes. Moved by her tearful appeal, John repeatedly suggested to me, What do you think about us living with my mom at her family home? Indeed, his mother is unemployed and has no income. She might have received some property settlement at the time of the divorce, but she struggles with living and house maintenance expenses. Previously, there was no concern when John lived with his mother, but since our marriage and his moving out, she has been alone. John pleaded with me almost daily, saying, there's plenty of room at my parents' house, and I don't intend to burden you with household chores. Won't you consider living together? Moreover, he tearfully appealed to me, Courtney, please think of helping this frail old woman. I was surprised to hear him describe her as frail. Realizing how difficult their living situation was, I became concerned about my mother-in-law. Thus, I reluctantly decided to live with her. When I agreed, John and his mother hugged each other happily. While I thought living together might not be bad if it made them happy, deep down, I wished to enjoy newlywed life just with John. Thus, despite being newlyweds, we started living in his mother's house. Both John and I work, but honestly, John wasn't particularly skilled at his job. His goal was to master his favorite burger and open his own burger shop. He was apprenticing at a burger shop while working. I admired his pursuit of this dream, but it seemed to have reduced his time for family. In the first month, his mother thanked us for living together. However, as we got busy with work, she started considering the house her territory during the day and began treating me rudely. Hey, Courtney, please don't put plastic bottles in that trash can. How have you been living all this time? I can't believe you can't even sort garbage. What exactly did your parents teach you? My mother-in-law scolded me. I just replied, I'm sorry, at that time. I am not ignorant. Despite her insistence on proper sorting, I didn't know which trash bin at her house was for what kind of waste. When we moved into my in-law's house, a fair amount of garbage came out while unpacking. I tried to sort them accordingly. When I asked my mother-in-law how to sort the waste, she said, don't worry about it. I'll sort it out later. Yet, she complains every time I dispose of a plastic bottle but says nothing when John does the same. I do sort the garbage on collection days. I began to feel this was more than just nagging. Furthermore, she demanded I do more housework, even though it's impossible for me to prepare lunch while working. I firmly told my mother-in-law, it's impossible. Then she insisted, don't say impossible. As a daughter-in-law, you should comply with my requests. This attitude surprised and disappointed me. Who was it that tearfully begged us to live together? Coming here was likely a bad deal. Probably, her real intention was to secure financial support from her son. An unwanted daughter-in-law was just an obstacle. While I was struggling with my relationship with my mother-in-law, I received news from my company about starting remote work. It was deemed less stressful and more efficient than commuting. However, this remote work was optional, not mandatory for all employees. It seemed like the company was gathering some examples to consider a full-scale implementation. I started working from home, thinking it would enable me to prepare lunch, as my mother-in-law had repeatedly requested. 
But even after preparing meals and managing housework, her attitude didn't improve. Instead, she began to express her dissatisfaction about my presence at home, saying, If only my daughter-in-law weren't here, the atmosphere of the house wouldn't have turned so bad. I'm really fed up with this. Her words hurt me. Doing housework here felt like a greater burden than normal. Particularly, John is sloppy, not sorting garbage or taking care of his laundry. It's always me who has to gather his laundry from his room. Yet, he takes this for granted and often complains. Why can't I find my favorite socks? They're just hung out to dry. What? I plan to wear them today. You're too late with the laundry. You should try harder at housework. He calmly expressed his dissatisfaction like this. I don't understand why I am being blamed when the real problem is John not doing his laundry. His words were shocking. Furthermore, his mother, agreeing with John, also criticized me. That's right. Courtney is always at home, so why can't she manage the household chores properly? She rebuked. It felt like they were mocking me. I was astounded by how they thought our current living standard was maintained. In addition to this, unbelievable words came from my mother-in-law and John. Now that Wendy is coming back, having such an inept daughter-in-law will be embarrassing. I can't imagine what she'll think. Certainly, Wendy has become quite responsible. If she finds out how clumsy my wife is, she'll probably mock me. I hadn't been informed about Wendy's return. I only found out through their conversation. Wendy is John's biological sister and my sister-in-law. She got married two years ago and currently lives with her husband. I haven't talked much with Wendy, but from the attitudes of my mother-in-law and John, I felt like she also looks down on me. I was disappointed, wondering if there's anyone reasonable in this house. On the day of Wendy's arrival, my mother-in-law was excited. Wendy came in with her suitcase, sat down on the living room sofa, and said, there's nothing like being at home. I offered her some drink, but surprisingly, she asked, who is this person? As if she didn't know me, despite attending my wedding with John. I should have told her I was John's wife, but my mother-in-law spoke before I could. Listen, Wendy, this is John's wife. She can't handle household chores properly, always has a tense expression, and never does anything right. She used to work, but now she just stays at home. My mother-in-law said in front of me, I was shocked. I haven't quit my job. I switched to remote work, considering our family situation. Despite explaining this to John and my mother-in-law beforehand, it seemed she hadn't listened at all. Wendy seemed to believe her mother's story. What? An unemployed person in the house? Why would you keep such a person? She's the type who won't understand until she experiences hardship. She said that while laughing mockingly. My mother-in-law agreed, indeed. Then she turned to me, listen, Courtney, you should know Wendy is pregnant and wants to give birth at home. I was taken aback as this was news to me. I wasn't informed about her return or her pregnancy. It seemed they had discussed it already, but I was completely out of the loop. Even though there is a spare room, the arrival of a pregnant woman in the house will surely add to the financial burden. Yet, nobody had informed me about this in advance. This situation itself was surprising, but what my mother-in-law said next was even more shocking. Wendy is coming back for her pregnancy, so jobless like you should get out. We don't need someone without an income in this house. Get out before Wendy comes back with her things. If you don't pack up, I'll throw away all your belongings. She declared, stunned, I had to ask, are you serious? Honestly, I felt relieved at the thought of leaving. It's much better to live on my own terms than to be mistreated by this family. The ones who will be troubled by my absence should be my mother-in-law, John, and the returning Wendy. Yet, as if not understanding her own situation, my mother-in-law said, we'll have no problem without you. Then, I shall leave this house. I was fed up with being looked down upon by my mother-in-law and Wendy and John's concurrence. John, who was always ladies first in front of his sister and mother, showed indifference to me, always prioritizing them. Maybe during our dates, he was attentive to me just because he used to prioritize his sister and mother back home. 
But since we started living with his mother, all his kindness was directed towards her and I received none. Perhaps I was just a supporter for him to realize his dreams. Good only for providing money. I immediately contacted a certain person. To that person, I first said, I'm breaking up with John, so please collect the rent from him or his mother from now on. When they asked why, I explained that I was ordered to leave the house because when he was coming back for childbirth. They responded with an apology. I'm really sorry, and assured, leave the future arrangements to me. Afterward, I stayed in a hotel for a while, searching for a place to live alone. During this time, I received frantic calls from John. What do you mean by divorcing? And what's this about repayment? I thought we were doing well. Doing well? You kick out your wife for your sister and you ask what's wrong? I retorted. Kicked out? What are you talking about? Didn't you decide to leave yourself so Wendy wouldn't be stressed during her stay? John said. It seemed like my mother-in-law and Wendy had convinced him that I left on my own accord. However, the truth was different. I left because I was told I'd be thrown out with all my belongings if I didn't. I had to escape with my stuff, fearing what might happen if I stayed, I explained. I had thought John would never know the truth about me being expelled by his mother and sister. But to think he actually believed I left on my own accord. That shocked me. By the way, did your father come to the house? Huh? Yeah, he did. I didn't quite get it. He mentioned something about rent, but we own the house, so there's no rent to pay. At that moment, I couldn't help but exclaim loudly, What? Did you forget the explanation when we moved in? When your parents got divorced, the house was in your father's name. But your mother refused to leave. In the end, it was rented out for $2,000 a month. Really? He was surprised. Yes. Your mother was supposed to pay the rent monthly as part of the property division. But when she couldn't pay, we were asked to live together and pay the rent. But I've never paid any rent. He said. That made sense. Jun's income was low because he spent a lot of time training at the burger shop. Thus, I had been covering the $2,000 rent. I used to give it directly to his mother, who then made the payment from her bank account. I had informed them about this at the beginning of our cohabitation. I was appalled that his mother had forgotten that I was paying the rent. It's clear I've been paying $2,000 every month. But now that we're separating, I won't pay for that house anymore. What? John sounded shocked. That's why I informed your father. Since I won't be paying any more, your mother should get the money from you. He came to talk about this today. Hearing this, John was flustered, but I couldn't understand why he was so perturbed. John, who was so absorbed in his training and considerate towards his mother, leaving me without kindness, now acted like a victim. I realized once again what a terrible family they were. Anyway, your father should have received the divorce papers I filled out. Make sure you pay up. Wait, what is this promissory note about? John asked. I sighed. Why does he so easily forget important things? That promissory note is something you suggested, remember? You said, I'll work hard to pursue my dream. So, I'll leave the household finances to you. I'll calculate and repay all the excess payments later. That's why I made the promissory note. Oh, did I say that? John said that in a small, uncertain voice. Has he finally remembered? He seemed to have forgotten what he once promised. I'm moving forward with the divorce. I can't afford to wait for your dream to come true. If we hadn't lived together, you wouldn't have gone so overboard. Paying $2,000 in rent plus the living expenses for three people every month was an unnecessary expense. The rent and living expenses of our previous apartment weren't that high, but living in John's family home had driven up costs. Therefore, the amount John owed me kept increasing. Please, don't divorce me. I have no one but you. He pleaded, What? I don't need a husband like you. Someone who doesn't pay, neglects housework, doesn't cherish his wife, and disregards family. I don't need such a husband. If you don't want to submit the divorce papers, shall we discuss it through a lawyer? I said and hung up the phone. Later, John apparently lashed out at his mother and Winnie for the first time. Why did you do something to drive Courtney out? Because of you? 
I can't pursue my dream and am now buried in debt. He yelled. His mother and Wendy were scolded by John for the first time, with Wendy in tears and his mother in shock. Despite this situation, John's father firmly declared, if you can't make the financial payments, leave this house by the end of the month. He threatened to call the police if they were still there next month, leaving them scrambling to pack. Wendy's husband came to pick her up, learning everything from his father-in-law and reprimanding her for her shameful behavior. Meanwhile, John and his mother were forced to live in a shabby apartment. Their current living situation is drastically different from before, and both are struggling. John has quit his apprenticeship at the burger shop to work hard and earn money, taking on two part-time jobs to make the payments to me. His mother, told by John to earn the living expenses, is working multiple part-time jobs to cover the rent and living expenses for the two of them. It seems they are having a hard time now, after living an easy life before. I feel they finally get their just desserts. The thought of being free from their exploitation makes me feel like my life is brightening up. Determined to reclaim the time I lost, I've decided to pursue my happiness from now on. How much do you want? We're willing to pay, so let's settle this. The reason I panicked was because, the moment I entered the hospital room, she said words I'd never expected. Wait, what? Mia, are you serious about what you just said? Yes, I am. Explain yourself. They treated us so terribly, it almost led to a major tragedy. It was clear they were mocking us. After doing something so terrible, they want to settle with money? I can't accept a settlement. Mia, take responsibility properly. That's unbelievable. You're as stubborn as ever. You don't know what might happen if you make us angry. Don't push it. Suppressing my anger, I continued to argue with this brazen and shameless couple. I think we've heard enough. My husband intervened in the argument. I had never seen such a frightening expression on my husband's face before. Mia, you've always believed that money can solve everything since high school. You haven't changed. Everyone wants money, right? Am I wrong? That's right. As long as you have money, you can solve anything. Even this woman will shut up if you give her money. Facing the couple, my husband said, if that's the case, let's see if we can really settle this with money. Mia and her husband were overwhelmed by my husband's suggestion, but in the end, they left the hospital room with some provoking words. As Mia said, maybe everyone does want money. Money brings us happiness and joy, like magic. It's the only thing with such magical power in this world. But, as my husband said, there are things money can't solve or buy. Along with their attempt to almost kill me and my baby, they would soon understand this whether they like it or not. I am Susan Johnson. I'm 32 years old and nine months pregnant. My husband Kevin, also 32 eagerly awaits the birth of our child. To celebrate this momentous occasion, we wanted to share our joy quietly, but it wasn't going to be easy. Because there was someone who didn't like the fact that we were going to have a child. That person was none other than Mia, a high school acquaintance and a fellow mother, who always managed to meddle in my life. Mia, who was a senior to both me and my husband during high school, came from a wealthy family that owned a big company. She was beautiful, excelled academically and athletically, and was like the idol of our school. But being pampered by her parents from a young age made her extremely selfish. She misunderstood that she could get anything with money, and so she had a bad reputation. Despite this, she was interested in Kevin and used both force and money to try to make him her boyfriend. However, Kevin was not interested in her and always cared for me. So, I became his girlfriend instead of Mia. She didn't like Kevin choosing me, and from then on, she saw me as a rival. You and Kevin don't match. Break up with him now. But, Mia, that's too much. Kevin, you know I'm more beautiful than Susan, and I have money. Please stop, Mia. Don't say things like that. We were tormented by Mia's harsh words and money throughout high school. I consulted with teachers multiple times, but even they couldn't stand up to Mia's financial power, and the situation remained unresolved. After Mia graduated, we avoided her as much as possible, 
not wanting to provoke her. We lost contact with her for a while. Several years later, Mia unexpectedly reappeared in our lives and confronted us. Oh, Susan and Kevin. I haven't seen you in a while, but it looks like you've built a decent life despite being poor. Mia had also gotten married and had kids. Her family flaunted luxury brands and drove expensive cars. She continued her high school ways, using her wealth to control her fellow mothers, even possibly giving them money as allowance. Many of them declined, but they were tempted by the money and ended up accepting it. In exchange for the money, they had to do whatever Mia asked. Then Mia, using the mom friend she had paid off, began to harass us. Susan, your fashion sense has always been lacking, hasn't it? Has Kevin never really bought you any decent clothes since the old days? Can you stop parading on the main street like you own it? You should walk down the side streets. This isn't a place for people like you. Here, take some money and have lunch at some family restaurant or diner. Mia would criticize our appearance and actions like this, flaunt her money, and continue to harass us just like in high school. The more you react to people like that, the more they want to annoy you. So, just ignore her and she'll probably stop someday. I initially wanted to argue with my husband's advice, but soon accepted his words. Indeed, as my husband said, it was evident that people like Mia escalated their harassment when they got a reaction. Together with my husband, we dealt with Mia's provocations with minimal interaction and ensured that her words didn't affect us. One day, I found out I was pregnant, the moment I shared the news with my husband. He was overjoyed, ready to take on his role as a father with pride and do his best for our child. Inspired by my husband's determination, I also mustered the courage to live proudly as a mother and as a person. I hoped for peaceful days without Mia's harassment. But reality was not so kind. One day, nine months into my pregnancy, I encountered Mia while returning from shopping with my visibly swollen belly. Oh, Susan, you've gotten so fat since the last time I saw you. What have you been eating to look so embarrassing? Huh? This isn't because I've gained weight. I'm pregnant. It's natural. If you have no business with me, could you please be quiet? Apparently angered by my response. Mia stood in my way. You might have a bigger belly now, but it seems your attitude has grown too. How dare someone poor and plain like you get pregnant? You're really pushing my buttons. I don't care what you think, Mia. I just want to have my child in peace. I tried to defuse the situation, but it only angered Mia further. Excuse me, Susan? Is that how you speak to me? As I tried to walk away, Mia chased after me, attempting to grab my arm. In the ensuing commotion, her right arm struck my belly hard. The impact made me fall, and a sharp pain radiated from my abdomen. In agony, I hurriedly took out my phone from my bag and called my husband, barely managing to say, the baby. What should I do? Before I lost consciousness. When I woke up, I realized I was in a hospital bed. Feeling warm under an electric blanket with an four drip in my arm, I heard familiar voices nearby. As I turned, I saw my close friends, Olivia and Emma, sitting beside me. Why are you here? Oh, is my baby okay? Don't move, Susan. You need to rest. I tried to sit up but was stopped by the sharp pain in my belly. Olivia and Emma tried to help me lay down, and that's when I noticed my belly had shrunk. A nurse informed me that I had gone into premature labor shortly after losing consciousness, and they had performed an emergency C-section. The baby was in an incubator due to being premature but was thankfully healthy. My husband, sensing the urgency of my call, had rushed over. He'd been informed of what had transpired by Olivia, Emma, and the attending doctor, and was livid. At that time, following Olivia and Emma's advice to get plenty of rest, I decided to focus on my recovery so I could see the baby as soon as possible. However, the next day, an unexpected pair visited my hospital room. Mia and her husband, Matt. Mia, how ardacious of you. Just to be sure, why are you here? Olivia and Emma stared sternly at the couple. However, the two of them approached my bed as if they didn't even see them. 
How audacious of them to just barge into my room without knocking, especially after what they did to me. I felt so disgusted that I couldn't help but twist my face in repulsion. Then, the rude couple suddenly threw out an unbelievable proposition. We'll be straightforward. How much do you want? Excuse me? How much do you want? I'm offering to pay, so let's settle this. The moment they stepped into the room and uttered those unexpected words, I panicked. Wait, what? Mia, are you serious about what you just said? Yes, I am. Explain yourself. They had been so close to causing a major tragedy, and their terrible treatment of us was evident. To suggest settling all of this with money after all they did was unthinkable. I can't accept a settlement. Mia, take responsibility properly. But instead of listening, Mia and Matt just kept hurling insults. That's unbelievable. You're as stubborn as ever. You don't know what might happen if you make us angry. Don't push it. It's not about being stubborn. You should stop making ridiculous claims and looking down on us. Yeah, Mia. Have you forgotten what you did to Susan? One misstep and it could have been a much bigger problem. Susan's baby was really in her belly. And you put them in danger without thinking. And now you're offering money as if that makes everything okay? Shouldn't you be grateful? Just take the settlement before you make us even angrier. Know your place. It's like you weren't taught anything by your parents. Olivia and Emma, in agreement with me, rebuked Mia and Matt, who just grew more infuriated and let loose on not just me, but also on them. As everyone forgot they were in a hospital and argued, the door of the room slowly opened with a creak. I understand what you're trying to say, but there's no way we're going to resolve this with money. My husband spoke with a quiet but firm voice. Olivia and Emma looked at him in surprise. Mia and Matt hadn't expected him, and his unprecedented fury made them shrink back. Seeing the side of my husband was new to me, Olivia, and Emma. We were rendered speechless by his anger. My husband went up to Mia and Matt and said with a powerful tone, Mia, you've always believed that money can solve everything since high school. You haven't changed. Everyone wants money, right? Am I wrong? Well, everyone desires money. There are things it can't buy or problems it can't solve. This incident is indeed a prime example. And no matter how much money was offered, I couldn't accept it. Both my daughter in the incubator and I are fortunately healthy and alive, but we might have been sent to the afterlife, despite it being such a grave incident. Mia seemed to have no remorse or understanding at all. The same goes for Matt who was sitting next to her. They probably just have that kind of mindset. Thinking this way, my anger towards them grew, and I didn't want them to suggest so casually that this matter could be resolved with money. I feel the same way as Kevin. If money could resolve everything, there would be no need to involve the police or lawyers. Let me make this clear once again. You both should take responsibility. What's with you? You're more stubborn than usual today, aren't you? Aren't you all happy if you receive money? That's right. Anything can be resolved as long as you have money. You should keep quiet if you're given some. You should know your place. Weren't you taught anything by your parents? At this point, seeing Mia and Matt rudely cursing and acting as if money was the solution to all problems, I didn't even have the energy to get angry anymore. But then, my husband, pointing at Mia and Matt, said strongly, if you believe money can settle this, why don't we put that to a test? Huh? What do you mean? What? Mia and Matt were taken aback by my husband's insinuation, and I was equally puzzled. Yet, with mocking expressions, Mia and Matt confronted my husband. Are you out of your mind? What are you trying to do? Poor people like you and Susan can't do anything. Mia spat out those words and left the hospital room with Matt. Kevin, are you sure about what you said? I'll handle everything. Don't worry, my dear. There's nothing to be concerned about. After saying that, for some reason, Kevin made eye contacts with Olivia and Emma. As if Olivia and Emma understood, they both nodded and told me reassuringly, don't worry. I still didn't fully understand the situation, but the stress from the confrontation was taking a toll on my post-surgery body. I wanted to avoid any further confrontations or arguments. So, 
I decided to rely on my husband and focus on my recovery. The next evening, Mia stormed into the hospital, her face beat red with anger. Seeing her face, it was clear she was furious. Hey, I know you're in there. Get up and come out right now, you cowardly, tacky woman. You set this whole thing up, didn't you? I can see right through it. Nurses outside the hospital room were arguing with her as she continued to shout, her voice filled with anger. At that moment, my husband, who was on his way back from work, saw Mia causing a scene outside the hospital and calmly said to her, what are you thinking? Bursting into the hospital and shouting like this, are you out of your mind? Mia exploded with rage at him. I know everything. Just because of a simple disagreement, you decided to involve the police and lawyers? Susan and you orchestrated all of this, didn't you? Just because? You say strange things. For a delusional woman like you, that's probably the most effective and fitting response. What? You're being inconsiderate to the other patients. Now, leave. Make your excuses at the police station. At Kevin's words, Mia's anger intensified as she tried to approach my room. However, she was stopped by the security guards who were alerted by the commotion. Her voice grew fainter, presumably as she was escorted out of the hospital. I could hear sirens and Mia's shouts outside, suggesting Kevin had reported her and the police were taking her away. That night, I received a call from Matt. I have a request. Please don't make this situation any bigger and don't involve me anymore. I'm divorcing her. I won't do anything else to you, please. He called out of nowhere, spouting incomprehensible things and acting selfishly. If the wife is as she is, the husband is as well. I'll hear the details later. Stop bothering me with your baseless, selfish claims. After I hung up on him, I immediately blocked his number and could finally settle into the peaceful rest that followed after. Later, I learned that Kevin had close friends, among them Olivia and Emma's husbands. Coincidentally, Olivia's husband was a police officer and Emma's husband was a journalist. After the incident with Mia and Matt at the hospital, Kevin had asked for their help. They gladly agreed. Olivia and Emma also offered their assistance as they were furious at Mia's actions. First, Kevin filed an assault and injury complaint against Mia, which, thanks to the help of Olivia's police connections, led to her arrest. During the subsequent interrogation by Emma, who was a lawyer, Mia desperately tried to defend herself. However, Olivia had recorded the conversation in the hospital and presented it as evidence. With the additional eyewitness accounts of Olivia and Emma, Mia was found guilty and was ordered to pay a hefty compensation. Thanks to Emma's husband, the whole affair was published in the newspaper. As a result, not only Mia but her family also suffered a significant blow. It was revealed that her parents had embezzled company funds to cover up their daughter's misdeeds, plunging their business into crisis. As for Matt, he was acting selfishly, leveraging Mia's financial power, which made everyone have a negative impression of him. And it seemed like rumors about him spread at work. Matt was met with cold stares from his colleagues, and there were whispers about him here and there, deteriorating his relationship with his co-workers. The situation worsened further as the rumor reached the HR department. The upper management of the company began to distrust Matt and as a result, the HR department decided to transfer Matt to another branch. Naturally, Matt and Mia got divorced. Mia was disowned by her parents, and even her children were taken away from her. Struggling with the debt from the compensation and socially isolated due to the incident, she reportedly ended up living as a homeless person in a park. Olivia and Emma saw her receiving food at a soup kitchen. On the other hand, Matt, unable to handle the isolation and gossip at work, suddenly quit. Rumors said he left on a train, but his whereabouts remained unknown. Several months after the incident, I was discharged from the hospital and both my child and I were in excellent health. We received substantial compensation from Mia. My daughter showed no after effects and has been growing healthily. With this incident, I deepened not only my bond with my husband but also with my friends including Olivia and Emma. Now, peaceful days have returned to us and we are truly happy.